Hi folks, and welcome to the last lecture video for Unit 8 on Aquatic and Terrestrial Pollution. And today we're going to talk about toxicity, the lethal dose of different toxins, and dose response curves. And this has a lot to do with uh, the variety of different pollutants that we've talked about over the past two units, really. Everything from ozone all the way up to mercury and lead. Um, all of those things have different levels of toxicity and can be lethal at different dosages. So when we think about toxic chemicals, like I was just saying, uh, there's the obvious ones, like ones we've talked about, like lead and asbestos, um, but there's a lot of other ones as well, uh, like BPA, diesel, fluoride, tin, uh, aluminum, pesticides, and um, uh, flame retardants like asbestos, um, insect pesticides, herbicides, you name it. Um, these things can cause cancer, they can be carcinogens, they can cause mutations if they're mutagens, they can cause mutations in the fetus of an unborn baby if they're teratogens. Um, they can also be endocrine disruptors, something else we've talked about, which are chemicals that interfere with the hormonal system or the endocrine system of the body, preventing hormones from binding with the proper receptors on the cell and uh, basically inhibiting the response of a hormone like testosterone or progesterone or estrogen or adrenaline. Uh, they are, toxin chemicals can also accumulate within an organism's tissue through bioaccumulation, and they can biomagnify up the food chain. These are all things we've talked about so far. Um, and many of the different sources include wastewater, industry runoff, agricultural runoff, uh, urban runoff, landfills, combustion of fossil fuels, etc. Um, and here are some of the examples of things that we've talked about. Uh, in this unit, anyway, heavy metals like arsenic, lead, and mercury, uh, plastic number, oh, I want to say plastic number three, PVCs, is actually toxic um, if you ingest it or get it in your bloodstream, and um, POPs, uh, persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and DDT. Uh, the 10 deadliest poisons in the world are, a lot of them are actually totally natural and not made in a lab. You might recognize ricin if you ever watched Breaking Bad. There's a uh, plot line with that. But strychnine, uh, pterodoxin, uh, terat, tet, oh my goodness, tetrodotoxin uh, is found in some fish. These are from the poison dart frogs, some um, bacteria from botulin, botulism, um, some mushrooms, you know, uh, rat poison. A couple of these are man-made. Cyanide is actually found in apple seeds. So there's a lot of different uh, toxins and po or poisons that can be found in nature. Um, and depending on how toxic, how lethal that substance is, you will have to take more or less of it to die. Um, so toxicity is the measure of a harmfulness of a substance. Its ability to cause injury or death to a living organism. The more toxic it is, uh, the more harmful it is, right? And the dosage is the amount of chemical that the person has ingested or inhaled. Uh, and so you'll find that if something that is more toxic has a higher or... Um, well, let me rephrase that. If something is more toxic is a, a higher dose... Uh, let me rephrase this again. If something is more toxic, then a, it will take a smaller dose to kill you, right? And we'll explore that, that concept. They're inversely related, but we'll explore that contact, concept as we go through. And if you look at... Uh, this is just some random table I found online for some dog medicine. But if you look at the dosage of different amounts of milligrams, a half of a 25 milligram tablet, a whole 25 milligram tablet, half of a 75 milligram tablet goes up and up and up as the dog's weight increases. And that's because uh, there are a lot of different factors that impact toxicity, not, not only including weight, but also your age, right? Um, for something like ibuprofen, you give a different amount uh, to a child versus an older adult. And a lot of that has to do with your weight, your body's ability ability to digest and absorb that uh, toxin. Uh, but also your genetic makeup, as well as the performance of your organs that detoxify your blood, including the kidneys, the liver, uh, and the intestines. If you've got kidney damage or liver damage, you're not gonna, your body's not going to be as good as filtering out toxins. And so toxins will be more deadly to you. Uh, additionally, bioaccumulation and biomagnification, organisms are going to be more susceptible to toxins when they are at the top of a food chain because they are uh, uh, subject to biomagnification. And additionally, the how long you are exposed to the toxin will uh, impact its impact or will, will alter its impact on you. If you have acute exposure, this is a short-term, um, immediate 
uh, exposure to this toxin, maybe a one-time thing, it's possibly very temporary, versus a chronic exposure is long-term, repeated, or permanent exposure to a toxin, right? So the example I like to give is when you go and get an x-ray at the dentist or the doctor or something like that, um, and they put the x-ray machine over you, they put on all this gear and they go stand behind a wall before they turn on the x-ray machine. And a lot of people wonder, like, why is it safe for me to be in the x-ray machine if the nurse has to go behind a wall with all this protective gear on? And that's the difference between acute and chronic exposure. You're only exposed to x-rays for a very short amount of time, acute exposure, whereas the x-ray technician is doing this all day long. So they are going to be exposed to x-rays multiple, multiple times, which is why they need so much protective gear. So how do we measure toxicity? Uh, we measure it using a term called LD50, or lethal dose 50. And this is the, um, the dose of a substance that is required to kill 50% of the population. Usually we refer to it as a test population because you're in a closed uh, experimental uh, environment where you're testing the lethality of the drug. Uh, you might see another term, LC50, which stands for lethal concentration 50. It's the same idea, but instead of um, a solid, uh, the dosage of the, or the toxin is usually in air as a gas or a vapor, or is dissolved in water as a liquid. Uh, but it's the same idea. Uh, at what dosage will it kill 50% of the test population? Uh, and general rules of thumb about LD50, this is what I was trying to explain earlier and did not do a good job and had to rephrase it 30 million times, um, is that the, the lower the dosage, uh, the more lethal the substance, right? So if, you, if the amount of substance required to kill half of the population, if that amount is very small, that means that that substance is very toxic, right? So here's an example. Heroin, this is the amount of heroin required to uh, the LD50, the amount, the dosage of heroin required to kill 50% uh, of a test population, and this is the amount of fentanyl. So this is a much smaller dosage, and as you may know, fentanyl is much, much, much more toxic and lethal to humans than heroin is. Additionally, you need to understand that because this test is being done within a test population, uh, we can really only apply the results to that population. We have to be a little bit careful about saying, oh, well, because it was the LD50 in this controlled study, that means that LD50 is the same no matter where we go, what type of humans or organisms we test. Um, it's going to vary, right? You can only control for so many things. So here's um, a table looking at a bunch of different substances and the LD50 for a rat and for a person. Um, and if you take a look at this, we've got some detergents, we've got fruit flavorings, moisturizer, caffeine, nicotine. So you could see that there's a wide variety of different substances on here, right? Um, and this is going to give us... So ethyl, uh, ethyl acetate, which is a fruit flavoring, um, in a... If we did this test in a rat, it's uh, 5,620 milligrams of ethyl acetate required um, for every kilogram of rat. Um, so if we have a three kilogram rat, it's going to take like three times this number. Whereas in a human, uh, generally speaking, it's about 383 grams. So what do you think the relationship is between this number, uh, the size of this number, and the lethality? Yeah, exactly. As this number goes up, um, the substance becomes less toxic because you need to take more of it to kill you. Whereas something like this, pufferfish poison, is extremely poisonous because a very, very small amount will kill you, right? Um, that's kind of intuitive when you think about it. Uh, everything in moderation, though. Phosphoric acid is found in sodas, so if there are 60 milligrams of phosphoric acid in one Coke, how many Cokes would you have to drink to die of phosphoric acid poisoning? The answer is quite a lot. It's like 17,700 something. Um, I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but it will be there in the Ed Puzzle. Uh, so you'll have to, you, you would probably die of, of like drowning before you <laughs> died of phosphoric acid poisoning. But the point is, any substance uh, off this list could kill you if you're exposed to a large enough dose. Um, and if we take a look at this, uh, this is the uh, lethal dose on the x-axis of this graph. And on the y-axis, we've got the dependence potential, meaning the likelihood that you could become addicted to it. Um, so we're looking at that lethal dose ratio and dependence potential of different psychoactive drugs. And you could see something like heroin has a very high uh, um, lethal dose, uh, but is also uh, very highly uh, addictive, right? Uh, so this is really, really dangerous because... Um, what that means is it is very addictive and it doesn't take much to kill you, right? Whereas something on the other end, um, like LSD, um, is 
not nearly as addictive and has a much smaller dose. So there is a relationship between addictiveness and uh, the dosage that will be required to kill you. Uh, but generally speaking, I would an, uh, encourage you to avoid all of these drugs, uh, obviously, um, and even caffeine. I would, I would avoid as much caffeine as you can, certainly these other ones, um, including nicotine and alcohol. Um, Alrighty, and uh, lastly, uh, what we're kind of looking at here, well, actually, this isn't really a dose response curve, but a dose response curve is a way to look at the relationship between the dosage and the impact it has on the population, right? So oftentimes, what we see is the dosage is on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we see some sort of metric, usually mortality, right? And so the LD50 is the dosage at which we see 50% of the population dying. So in this case, that would be here, 0.5 is 50%. So if we go over, we'd say, boom, right there, whatever this dosage is, that's the LD50. Right Here's another graph looking at the same thing. Uh, what would you say the LD50 is for this population? Yeah, it's about 10 milligrams for every kilogram of, of body weight, right? 50% of the population dies at this point, so we go over and we say, okay, now let's go down to the dosage. That's 10 grams. Um, how about uh, what would be the lethal dose for 100% of the population? Yeah, again, not super difficult, right? You find 100% on the y-axis, you go over, you go down, it'd be about 100 grams, or 100 milligrams for every kilogram. Here's some, an example of a more complex dose response curve. Uh, this is from an AP question. Um, and uh, it's a probability of illness from exposure to four different bacteria represented by these different dotted lines. Each one of these is a different dose response curve to these different um, <laughs> different bacteria. On the, y, on the x-axis, we've got the dosage of the bacteria, and on the y-axis, we've got the probability of illness. So why don't you take a few moments to answer the couple questions I've got on the side. Okay, great, and that's all I've got for you. If you've got questions about dose response curves, we're going to do a lab in class to practice this. Um, otherwise, bring your questions to class, and I will see you later.